So Andre's given us an introduction to the theoretical properties of black holes. Uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to what he calls the practical properties, <laughs> or what I call just essentially proofs of existence. So here is a picture of our nearest neighbor, nearest big neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy. You see his companion M32, uh, and then this boring galaxy, he, NGC 205, and you know, the many, many stars around this. And in this picture, there are roughly 10,002 black holes. <laughs> right? right. So the two black holes that we know about, definitely, there's a big black hole at the center of the Andromeda galaxy. There is a slightly smaller one at the center of M32. There's probably not one at the center of this dwarf elliptical, NGC 205. And then in the surrounding environment, in the, st the stars, among the stars surrounding each of these galaxies, they're roughly 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, who cares? Stellar mass black holes, right? So in astrophysics, there are at least two different types of black hole. And the type just refers to the origin. So stellar mass black holes, uh, they have masses of around about 10 times the mass of the sun. Andre pointed out that the Schwarzschild radius of the sun is three kilometers. So therefore, the horizon scale in these is about 30 kilometers. Right? These occur wherever you've got stars, particularly wherever you've got massive stars, because these are massive stars that have gone supernova and then they leave behind this stellar mass black hole remnant. In contrast, the bombastically named supermassive black holes, uh, they're much bigger. They're millions to billions times the mass of the sun. Uh, when you work out the horizon scale of that, it corresponds to solar system scales. Uh, they, they seem to be located at the centers of almost every biggish galaxy. And the only problem about them is we have no idea how they form. We know they're there, but we're not sure how they got there. Okay, and another thing that these have in common, apart from their fundamental physical properties, is that whenever you try to study them, with the best telescopes, you find that the angular size of the black hole's horizon is roughly the same in the nearest cases in both situations. So it's roughly 10 to the minus five seconds of arc, right? Where one arc second is basically, there's 3,600 arc seconds in a degree, right? So to give you a feeling for that number, the best optical and infrared telescopes, they can resolve 0.1 seconds of arc. So it's a factor 10 to the four, bigger than that. So to, from the point of view of astro, for most of the time in astrophysics, these black holes, they just look like new, Newtonian point masses, right? We can hope to measure the mass, but we can't hope to measure the spin, at least not directly, right? And so the name of the game in astrophysics then is to find a compact object, then argue that this compact mass has to be a black hole, just through lack of imagination, right? So here's an outline of my talk, very simple. I'll tell you about why we believe stellar mass black holes exist. Then I'll tell you about why supermassive black holes probably almost certainly exist. And I'll give you some consequences of these supermassive black holes. Okay, so stellar mass black holes, to remind you, we know where they come from. They're the remnants of dead stars, dead massive stars. Okay, so when you, whenever you think about stars, well, natural question to ask is what stops a star from collapsing into a black hole? And the answer is pressure support. Right. In, um, in normal stars, the pressure is provided by just the thermal pressure, the random motion due to the atoms that make up the star. Then <coughs> you've got special stars like white dwarfs and neutron stars. And in those cases, the pressure that prevents the stars from collapsing in the first case is electron degeneracy pressure, and the second case is neutron degeneracy pressure. Right. And I want to argue that there's a... I'm going to reproduce the arguments that say that there's a maximum mass for neutron stars, right? And that's most naturally done, most easily done in terms of energy inste instead of in terms of mass. So just run through that. So just to remind you of the Pauli exclusion principle, and that says that fermions are antisocial. They refuse to share states with one another. Identical fermions are antisocial and they refuse to, to share the same physical state. And so this means that if you take a, a gas of these objects and you reduce the temperature towards zero, then the kinetic energy of the system doesn't go towards zero. The internal energy doesn't go towards zero. But uh, at any given fixed point in space, there will be a range of mem momentum states that have to be populated. Right? That corresponds to a certain 
character, certain energy called the Fermi energy, right? So even when you cool these things down to zero temperature, uh, they still have some internal energy. And it's a nice exercise in second year undergraduate physics to show that if you have n of these identical fermions per unit volume, and they're moving ultra relativistically, so in other words, you squeeze their density enough that they whiz around very, very quickly, you can show that this Fermi energy scales as the cube root of the number density, right? Then just with the standard factors to make it have the right dimensions here, h bar times c. Okay, so that Fermi energy is important. Then here now is Landau's argument for why there's a maximum mass in such degenerate objects. He did this in 1932. Uh, that was actually before the discovery of the neutron. So yeah, just to show these Russians can do things. Right, so here is an example of uh, a simple idealized model of a neutron star. We've got n neutrons, each of mass m, and they're all bundled together in some radius r. There's the Fermi energy. And Landau's assumption was the very reasonable one is that you assume that the equilibrium state of this system is the state of minimum total energy. Okay, it's kind of hard to argue with that. So when you write down the star's total energy as a function of the number of neutrons and the radius over which they're spread, that's just going to be the kinetic energy, which is n times the Fermi energy to up to factors of order one. Uh, plus the gravitational potential energy, which up, again, up to factors of order one, is just going to be gm squared divided by the radius. Okay, you plug in the expressions for this, you get this thing here. You get a numerator that depends only on the, the total number of neutrons and the mass of the neutron, independent of radius, and then the denominator, just radius. Right. So then, if you look at this numerator, you see that if this numerator is less than zero, then if you happen to squeeze your star, if you reduce this radius, then the energy will go down, right? So then going back to this principle that says that this system is unstable, and so then by looking at the numerator, you rearrange the numerator and you get an expression for the maximum mass that a neutron star can have, right? It's given by this. There's a, on, there's a numerical factor in front of this, but when you work out what this thing here is, it's about 1.8 times the mass of the sun. Of course, this calculation was very, very simplified, and you can do more complete models that includes the equation of state of the neutrons. You know, here I've assumed that they're non-interacting. Uh, and you can include the effect of general relativity, which also becomes important in working out the gravitational potential energy. And this gives you numbers that are around about 3.1 solar masses. I think actually the most recent one is about 2.5, right? And it's very dependent on the, the unknown equation of state in QCD. Okay, so we know that there's this maximum mass that a neutron star can have. So that's, if we find a dark object, it has a mass bigger than this, it's probably not a neutron star, it must be something else, it must be a black hole, right? So then, in order to find these objects, to measure their masses, th the best place to go is to look at X-ray binary stars. Here's an artist's impression of one here. This, imagine you've got a circular binary. Here, you've got a dark object of mass M blob, and a star of mass m star. They're separated by a radius r. They're in a circular orbit. We don't see the compact object directly. We only see the star. Right. And then it's a nice exercise in first year mechanics, or maybe even high school mechanics, uh, to write down the equations of motion for this. So you immediately know the period of the system in terms of its radius and the two masses. Uh, because we we see only this star, we have to account for the reflex motion of that one, and then you can do that very easily then, just the, the, the velocity we observe is given by this, where the circular velocity of the system is given by this normal centra, circular motion thing from O level or GCSE physics probably, right? And then, so the, but the thing, the reason why I'm showing this, if you take this, you cube it, and you multiply it by that, the radius cancels out, Right? Radiar distances are very hard to measure in astrophysics. And so you have this quantity here. The period times the velocity cubed divided by 2 pi g is something that you can measure directly. And when you plug in what that corresponds to in the model, it corresponds to something which is going to give you a lower bound on the mass of the compact object. Right? It's very hard to argue with that. It's just Newtonian physics. Okay? So then you go off and you measure some of these systems. Here's an example 
V for, for Signy, the V means it's variable, um, it's a novae, it does all kinds of exciting things, but for the purposes of this talk, they're not interesting, right? And here is the heliocentric radio velocity as a function of time in this system of the companion star. The companion star is very boring. It's just a bit less than the mass of the sun. It's, like, it's not totally boring, it's distorted in interesting ways because of the companion. But anyway. So uh, you measure a velocity here, a peak velocity of 220 kilometers a second. The period is just over six days. You plug this into this minimum mass expression, this f of m, and you get the compact object must be at least seven times the mass of the sun, right? So it can't be a neutron star, presumably it's a black hole. Then you can do a bit more detailed modeling of this. You can model this light curve. You can model the properties of the companion star. And that gives you, more that gives you better constraints on the inclination and on the mass of the companion. And therefore, better constraints on the mass of the central object. And this is what you get then for a sample of many such objects. This shows the mass is divided into two categories here. This is roughly 3.1, this is the theoretical limit as of a few years ago for neutron stars. And you, you see you get a population here of things that are clearly neutron stars. Interestingly, their masses look very, very similar despite this upper bound. That's probably telling us something about the equation of state of this. But, but you also see a separate population right, of things that have masses that are much larger than that. Right? And so these are the stellar mass black holes. I think this is hard to argue with unless you want to believe in something even more exotic than black holes. Right. Okay, so that's stellar remnants. What about supermassive black holes? Right. In order to go through those, uh, let me, they've been long, suspect, long suspected to be at the centers of galaxies. Right. The observational evidence for these really began in the 1960s when quasars or quasi-stellar objects were discovered. So just to remind you, they were known for a long time. You've got these point-like sources, and they had a seemingly a weird distribution of spectral lines until 1963, I think Martin Schmidt pointed out, yet these were just the normal spectral lines we know and love from laboratory astrophysics. It's just that they've been redshifted so much that you, you don't recognize them unless you're looking for them. Right? You, they're not what you expect them to be. Right. And so these... Uh, so the since they have high redshifts, they're very distant, right? Um, and whenever you work out the power outputs of these, they outshine galaxies. So 10 to the 12 times the luminosity of the sun is a characteristic one. And some of them are variable on time scales of about a day, right? So you translate that uh, into uh, a distance.